On behalf of the American Heart Association, I would like to welcome you to the second session of today's Pain Management Summit, exploring the roles of the inpatient analgesic stewardship pharmacist, a vital member of the interdisciplinary pain management team. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly review how to use this platform for today's event. If you experience any technical difficulties, most user issues can be resolved by refreshing your browser. If that does not work, please review the system requirements or contact the Zoom webinar helpline. PDFs of the presentations are available in the Zoom events platform on the sessions page. Throughout today's presentation, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions for our speaker using the questions feature on your control panel. You may send in your questions at any time, and we will review the questions during our Q&A at the end of the presentation as time allows. This presentation will be recorded and available within the coming weeks at heart.org forward slash pain management. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Kim Freeman. Dr. Freeman is a pain management specialist and certified pain educator for Georgia's largest health system, the Wellstar Health System. Dr. Freeman pioneered Wellstar's first pharmacy-led pain management consultative service, where they received more than 200 physician-solicited consults annually. Her pain management practice model has fostered the expansion of pharmacy pain management consultative services to two additional Wellstar Health System hospitals, with plans for a third pharmacy pain management practice site to begin in 2023. Last year, Dr. Freeman and her pharmacy pain management colleagues were awarded the prestigious Best Practice Award from the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. Dr. Freeman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to share with you the unique roles pharmacists have in providing analgesic stewardship in the acute care setting. During the first part of this presentation, we will review data on opioid utilization in the hospital environment. Next, we will explore the vital contributions pharmacists make to the interdisciplinary pain management team. And then lastly, we will review data published in the primary literature demonstrating the benefits pharmacists provide when they actively participate in analgesic stewardship. This is the disclaimer statement from the American Heart Association. The information in this slide deck is for informational purposes only. And I also have no financial nor commercial conflicts of interest to disclose. There are three major learning objectives you will master by the conclusion of this presentation. The first learning objective is you will be able to compare and contrast opioid stewardship and analgesic stewardship. Secondly, when given an example of an inpatient pharmacist role, you will be able to provide one example of a stewardship activity the pharmacist can perform to support patients and the institution's goal. And then finally, you will be able to list at least three major benefits an inpatient pain management pharmacist provides. So let's begin. Pain is commonly the impetus that causes patients to present to the hospital. In fact, up to 42% of emergency department visits involve some type of pain complaint. Uncontrolled pain subjects patients to physiologic dysfunction, psychological illnesses, prolonged hospitalizations, increased hospital readmission rates and could expose patients to prolonged analgesic use. Opioids are frequently used to control pain in hospitalized patients. In fact, opioids are used in 50 to 80% of inpatient stays annually. It's believed that this high rate is possibly driven by treating the pain severity number 
instead of ordering analgesics based upon multidimensional indicators for improved pain control. We all know that prior to 2018, there was a value-based purchasing uh, pain management or patient satisfaction survey, and that pain management was oftentimes a metric that was assessed. Many providers felt compelled to aggressively manage pain, oftentimes using opioid therapy. It's believed that inpatient opioid use, along with other factors, are some of the contributing factors to the ongoing opioid epidemic in the United States. Here you can see 2016 data from the Centers for Disease Control describing physician opioid prescribing rates during and after emergency department visits. The rate of opioid administration given only during the ED encounter was 53.4 for every 1,000 adult ED visits. But I want you to note the other important opioid administration rates that are shown here. As you can see, some patients didn't re receive opioids in the ED and they were given opioid prescriptions at discharge. Opioid administration is not only high during the emergency department encounter, but patients seem to have high and persistent opioid use during their hospital course as well. Here is data from a study that was conducted by Donahue and colleagues that evaluated inpatient prescribing behaviors for opioid naive patients. Their data shows opioid administration occurs early during the hospitalization and persists throughout the entire length of stay. Now, while there is an inverse relationship between opioid administration and the length of stay, it is important to point out that 50 to 60 of the patient stay involved opioid administration beyond the two week mark, and that this pattern was observed across all patient care settings. What are some of the negative consequences associated with opioid use? Donahue and colleagues found that opioid naive patients given opioids during hospitalizations were almost three times more likely to still use them 90 days after hospital discharge and 3.4 times more likely to still use opioids one year later compared to patients who did not receive opioids during their hospitalization. We do know that prolonged opioid prescribing is the antecedent to opioid use disorder. Opioid use disorder can segue into addiction and lead to death. So here you can see an increase in the number of overdose deaths involving prescription opioids over the past several decades. As healthcare providers, it is our job to reverse this trend with judicious stewardship efforts. So how is judicious stewardship achieved? First, it is important to differentiate between opioid and analgesic stewardship. As you are aware, the term stewardship simply means to take care of something. The American Hospital Association states opioid stewardship is the commitment to safe opioid prescribing so that the right patient receives the right opioid for the right indication and the right length and dose of treatment. The Canadian Institute of Safe Medication Practices provides a broader definition of opioid stewardship, which not only involves safe opioid prescribing, but expands opioid stewardship to monitoring and evaluating how opioids are used to support and protect human health. Analgesic stewardship, on the other hand, involves opioid, excuse me, appropriate prescribing, patient monitoring, 
risk mitigation and surveillance, but this is done for all therapies used to reduce pain. So when you think about all therapies, this would include procedural interventions, non-opioid, pharmacologic, and non-pharmacologic therapies, cognitive behavioral treatments, such as music and distraction as well. Opioid management is just one component under the analgesic stewardship umbrella. It is my belief that when acute pain management is approached comprehensively with strong analgesic stewardship goals, opioid stewardship is enhanced as well. So now let's incorporate comprehensive analgesic stewardship into a safe and successful acute pain management service. The foundation of a successful pain management service begins with the patient. The patient's input should be solicited, respected. Um, it should be carefully considered when making treatment decisions. Next, it is important to pair the patient's input with evidence-based medicine. After doing that, you can then apply the four pillars of analgesic stewardship. The first pillar is the provision of scheduled non-opioid multimodal analgesics in patients who meet criteria. Now this facilitates pain control while limiting the reliance on opioids to achieve the pain management goal. Next, opioid therapy should be layered on top of non-opioid therapies using the lowest effective dose to achieve analgesia. After developing the patient's care plan, patients should be assessed daily with corresponding analgesic dosage adjustments for uncontrolled pain, controlled pain, and the presence of side effects. The last pillar is reserved for patients who have chronic pain or opioid use disorders. These patients require specialized treatment, especially during acute pain experiences. Therefore, referrals to a pain management specialist are oftentimes necessary when they come to the hospital. Now that we have the blueprint for safe and successful acute pain management, who is responsible for executing the program? Comprehensive pain management cannot be assigned to one discipline nor practice in silos. An interdisciplinary collaborative approach must be employed. So physicians, pharmacists, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, care coordinators, and the hospital spiritual support team, they all play an integral role in effective pain management. Today's discussion, however, will focus on the role pharmacists have in analgesic stewardship in the acute care setting. Again, a pain management pharmacist is a vital member of the interdisciplinary team. Pharmacists receive four years of training to become drug therapy experts with some pharmacists receiving an additional one to two years of postgraduate training to enhance their clinical skills. Pain management pharmacists are uniquely positioned to assess analgesic effectiveness, anticipate and treat analgesic adverse effects, evaluate improvements in activities of daily living, and to detect uh, aberrant drug behaviors when they are present. Multiple studies have demonstrated that pharmacists produce positive patient outcomes and institutional outcomes when they are actively engaged in analgesic stewardship. The International Association for the Study of Pain states that Pharmacists and providers should demonstrate proficiency and then be evaluated on core competencies in evidence-based practices related to pain management. The ISHP has laid out nine major learning objectives 
uh, that pharmacists should master to increase their clinical aptitude in pain management. As you can see, pharmacists are not only expected to understand pain pathophysiology, but they're also expected to classify pain syndromes, recommend evidence-based pharmacotherapies, assess and monitor patients, as well as actively participate in the interdisciplinary team. After gaining the core competencies needed to provide analgesic stewardship, pharmacists in collaboration with the hospital's administration and physician leadership should determine what patient care and surveillance activities are needed. Over the next few slides, we will review pharmacy best practice recommendations published by the Society of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists and the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists. In December of last year, the Society of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists published a white paper that outlined pharmacy pain management functions across the continuum of patient care. The white paper recommended nine major roles pharmacists should participate in. As you can see, pharmacists should provide leadership within the institution for stewardship initiatives and demonstrate a steadfast commitment to executing those activities. Pharmacists should, of course, share their drug expertise and make pain management interventions. They should also track and report metrics and develop quality improvement projects. There is always a need for pain management policies within the institution so pharmacists can create or monitor or revise those as needed. And finally, pharmacists should educate patients and providers. The Society of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists strongly recommend that a full-time pharmacists function in a dedicated role to ensure that all nine roles are executed at the highest performance level. It is very important for the hospital's administration to carefully prioritize the institution's analgesic stewardship goals, as well as assess resources available to support a full-time pain management pharmacist. The white paper then lists ancillary activities that support the nine major roles paying pharmacists should execute. In the red box column to the left, this shows inpatient specific activities. And so example pharmacist activities include participating in the hospital's regulatory team, uh, providing consultations for perioperative pain management, Pharmacists can review medication orders or monitor for opioid adverse events. They can help develop safe and effective opioid prescribing guidelines. If you look to the right, you'll see another red box column. And this column is applicable to the inpatient and outpatient setting. There you can see that pharmacists can participate in the interdisciplinary pain management team. They can develop pain management policies, protocols, or decision support tools. Again, they can educate providers or patients or conduct utilization reviews. Now, I've only restated a few of the many activities that are listed in this chart. I would encourage you to carefully review this chart with your clinical pharmacy staff to determine which activities are most needed at your institution. The American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists is another organization that has published recommendations on how pharmacists can collaborate with other disciplines to provide safe and effective pain management. There are five major domains identified by the ASHP task force that optimize stewardship efforts. 
So these domains were assigned to all healthcare providers and pharmacists or to ASHP and pharmacists. Domain three is pharmacy specific. It focuses on the unique role pain management pharmacists have in patient care, medication safety, and quality control. In domain three, ASHP recommends that pharmacists identify four pharmacy specific competencies for pain, and then again for opioid use disorder. Pharmacists should serve an integral role within the interdisciplinary team throughout the pain management process. They should evaluate interventions for safe and cost effectiveness while integrating multimodal treatments into patient care. And then again, they should participate in pain management quality assessment and outcomes measures. When you combine the recommendations from the Society of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists with those from ASHP, you'll notice some commonalities. The tape before you collates the recommendations from both societies. The chief pharmacist responsibilities are highlighted in red with example activities that support the major responsibilities highlighted in green. So let's take a look at risk mitigation and surveillance as an example. The pharmacist can review naloxone reports to identify and correct clinical scenarios that predispose patients to adverse drug reactions or the pharmacist could review medication profiles to make sure the patient is receiving constipation prophylaxis while receiving opioids. If you look under the direct patient care category, the pharmacist could provide consultations for patients with severe pain, or the pharmacist could assist physicians by recommending opioid tapering regimens prior to discharge. This table is not all inclusive um, by any means, but it is intended to serve as a framework to guide pain management pharmacists in developing successful pain management programs. Here is the MORE tool, which can be used to help hospital pharmacists incorporate some of the pain management activities recommended by ASHP and the Society of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists. This tool provides a methodical approach to daily patient chart reviews. I like it because it allows all pharmacists, those with and without pain management training to participate in analgesia stewardship. If you take a careful look at the tool, you notice it is relatively simple. It recommends interventions that reduce opioid overuse or mismanagement. It decreases the risk of opioid adverse events. It encourages non-opioid pharmacotherapy and provides decision support prompts to escalate care for patients that would be deemed to be complicated. This is the second part of the MORE tool. It helps pharmacists to identify patients at risk for substance use disorder. It also provides interventions for common opioid adverse events. When this tool was applied to a study population, interventions were recommended on 80% of patients with an 87.5% acceptance rate. Also, adverse events in the study population were reduced as well. So far, we have identified ongoing challenges with opioid prescribing in the inpatient setting. And we, re we reviewed pharmacy practice recommendations from the Society of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists and ASHP. We have also explored potential activities pain management pharmacists can provide. 
Now I would like to transition and show you how these recommendations can be put into real practice by demonstrating how our pharmacy-led pain management service operates. I am a pharmacist at Wellstar Cobb Hospital in Austell, Georgia, and our pharmacy-led pain management service began in 2013 as a consult service only. Currently, I serve as the only full-time pain management pharmacist at our hospital. I provide direct patient care via pain management consults that are solicited by our physicians. I also train our unit-based pharmacists to perform stewardship activities, including patient assessments, so that no patient with a pain management need is missed due to a lack of manpower. Our stewardship services are governed, of course, by our health system's analgesic stewardship policy, and all pharmacists, including myself, attend interdisciplinary rounds where pain management is discussed at the bedside and real-time interventions are made. Well, Star Health System's policies are vetted and supported by our physicians. Our pharmacists receive stewardship training during orientation and pharmacists must pass annual competencies to optimize their practice proficiency, as well as ensure that institutional goals are met. Over the next several slides, I will review Wellstar's analgesic stewardship policy and show how these practice management responsibilities are executed using surveillance reporting within our electronic medical record. Our stewardship policy has five major components. They are pain assessment, medication reconciliation and profile reviews, pain management consultations, high risk medication monitoring, and then we document all of our interventions. Step one of our policy states that the medical records will be reviewed with subsequent pain assessments and reassessments conducted by the pharmacist as time permits. Our EMR allows pharmacists to identify patients with severe pain scores greater than eight over the past 24 hours. This is a report that is generated by the EMR you can see that report highlighted in the panel on the right. This report helps pharmacists to prioritize patients who would require a face-to-face -face interaction and possible medication changes prior to interdisciplinary rounds. During rounds, the pharmacist's pain assessment complements the nurse's report so that the physician can make an informed decision about potential medication changes. Step two of the policy involves medication reconciliation. Our EMR gives all pharmacists one-click access to the Georgia Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. You can see a screenshot of our one-click access with the patient's PGMP report on the right. One-click access creates a lean process for pain medication reconciliation without requiring the pharmacist to leave the order entry module, then open another window to access the PDMP website. Our one-click access has been very helpful in reducing medication reconciliation prescribing errors. Another activity in step two of our policy involves assessing patients for the risk of adverse events before an opioid medication is given and then after administration. The Wellstar Health System has adopted the Michigan Opioid Safety Score as a risk mitigation tool that preemptively identifies patients at risk for opioid adverse events. We also use the Pacero Opioid Sedation Scale to detect impending adverse events after opioid administration. 
our EMR color codes both the MOS and the POS scores so that there is a visual prompt to help the pharmacist quickly identify high-risk patients for an opioid adverse event. Another pharmacist activity involves opioid adverse event prevention. Step three authorizes our pharmacists to initiate constipation prophylaxis for patients actively receiving opioids. Another provision of step three requires pharmacists to review the appropriateness of all fentanyl patch orders. The goal is to prevent inappropriate fentanyl patch use for acute pain management or the initiation of a fentanyl patch in opioid naive patients or in ICU patients transitioning off of fentanyl drips. You can see our fentanyl patch decision support tool for pharmacists in the graphic on the right. Finally, we review all morphine orders to ensure that patients with renal dysfunction are converted to a suitable opioid alternative. The goal is to prevent the toxic accumulation of morphine metabolites in renally compromised patients. Pharmacists can generate a morphine creatinine clearance report as you can see in the lower left-hand panel of the slide or they can simply follow order entry prompts when verifying orders for patients with morphine. The screenshot on the right shows the safety prompts that populate during order entry. The recommended medication alternatives are also provided in the same order entry screen to guide the pharmacist in conversations with the provider. So far, we have discussed the six components of a safe and effective or successful acute pain management service. And then we have reviewed the Society of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists and ASHP recommendations as it relates to pharmacist activities that support the pain management service. Now let's discover the benefits the patient and institution reap by incorporating a pain management pharmacist into the inpatient care model. In this study that was published last year, John Bosch and colleagues evaluated outcomes of a pharmacist-driven pain management consult service. They measured pain scores before the pharmacy consult, 48 hours later, and then again at discharge. Other outcomes measured included the number of morphine milligram equivalents consumed, uh, the total count of opioids and non-opioids administered, the incidence of concomitant benzodiazepine therapy, and then they measured patient safety. 80 patients met the pre-specified inclusion criteria. There was a statistically significant reduction in pain scores 48 hours after the pharmacy's consult and then again at discharge. Pharmacists also significantly reduce morphine milligram equivalents 48 hours after the pharmacy consult and at discharge. And then high risk benzodiazepine combinations were reduced as well. The next study I would like to review was conducted by Poirier at Coewa Delta Healthcare. Uh, the authors wanted to analyze data prior to the implementation of their pharmacy pain management consult service, and then three years after the service was implemented. Poirier and colleagues reported a statistically significant reduction in total opioid use after the pharmacy pain management program was implemented. Specifically, they noted decreases in IV hydromorphone, IV fentanyl, oxycodone, tramadol, and long-acting opioid usage. 
Now, while opioid administrations declined, there was also a corresponding increase in non-opioid and adjunctive therapies that were used. Poirier also reviewed HCAP scores to detect the patient's satisfaction with pain control. He reported that there were no detected decreases in patient satisfaction despite the reductions in opioid utilization. The pain management service also demonstrated a 75% reduction in opioid-related rapid response calls compared to the baseline control data. Lastly, Poirier reported a 1.5 to 1.8 million cost avoidance to the health system through stewardship activities, such as the provision of a prophylactic bowel regimen or the use of non-pharmacologic therapies. They also reduced concomitant CNS medications that had an impact on that savings. And then finally, when they adjusted medications for renal and hepatic dysfunction, they projected that as well to be a contributor to the cost avoidance that they estimated. The final published study we will review was conducted by Matthew and colleagues. This two-year retrospective analysis evaluated 100 patient charts that were seen by the pharmacy consult service at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. The authors assessed the patient's pain severity 24 hours prior to the pharmacy consultation, 24 hours after the consultation, and then 24 hours prior to discharge. Other outcomes measured were the patient's functional improvement, 14-day and 30-day readmissions, and opioid-related adverse events. The authors reported a three-point reduction in pain severity scores 24 hours after pharmacy consultation that was sustained until discharge. 86.6 of patient charts reported improvement in sleep, appetite, or, mobil or mobility, excuse me. And then patient readmissions due to pain were also very low. Although we haven't published our data, I would like to show you benefits that the Wellstar Health System has realized from pharmacist analgesic stewardship interventions. There are four pain management specialists within the Wellstar Health System, but all pharmacists are strongly encouraged to participate in stewardship activities. We utilize a train-the-trainer model to teach a designated pharmacist from each hospital in the health system the five major activities emphasized in our analgesic stewardship policy. The pharmacist designee was then responsible for training the staff at their hospital. We also leverage system-wide committees to design and implement performance improvement projects. Examples of a few projects that we've done to date include efforts to decrease IV opioid utilization and increase non-opioid utilization. We also desire to decrease naloxone administration as well as increase staff pharmacist interventions across the health system. One performance improvement project involved an automatic 72-hour stop on intravenous opioids. Using this approach, we noticed a 20% reduction in IV opioid utilization. We also encouraged the use of multimodal pain management therapies by creating a non-opioid multimodal order set. With the order set, we notice an increase in usage with a corresponding increase in non-opioid administration as well. We noted that interventions identifying prescribing errors related to fentanyl patches, methadone dosing, and buprenorphine prescribing improved 
after we integrated one click PBMP access into our electronic medical record. Our surveillance activities also reduced naloxone administrations. Uh, there was a 35% reduction in naloxone administrations after implementation of our system-wide program. Last year, we were awarded the SHP Best Practice Award for our development and implementation of this system-wide stewardship program. This is one of the highest honors a pharmacy program can receive for innovative initiatives that directly impact patient care. So in conclusion, I hope you've gained a better appreciation for the impact pharmacists can have on analgesic stewardship activities in the hospital setting. When designing your program, it's important to determine whether it will emphasize analgesic stewardship or opioid stewardship. Remember that analgesic stewardship is more of a comprehensive approach to pain management that encompasses all aspects of pain management, including opioid therapy. When you think about opioid stewardship, remember that it is more linearly focused. After determining your program's focus, ensure pharmacists are fully integrated into your program because pharmacists may engage in various analgesic stewardship roles. And finally, it is very important to measure pharmacist interventions and patient outcomes. The literature has consistently shown that pain management pharmacists positively impact the patient's and the institution by reducing pain severity, reducing opioid consumption, we increase non-opioid utilization and decrease opioid adverse events and naloxone administrations. With that, there should be a corresponding uh, improvement in patient functionality, possibly uh, increasing patient satisfaction, and then the institution reaps benefit by providing a cost of avoidance. I would like to thank you for your time and attention. At this time, I turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Freeman, for your presentation. It is my pleasure to now introduce our moderator for our Q&A, Dr. Bin Dong. Dr. Dong is a cardiologist and molecular geneticist at the Medical College of Georgia, Augusta University. Dr. Dong directs the Georgia Prevention Institute whose mission is to improve human health and healthcare across the lifespan through research, education, and service. He has been working with the American Heart Association on our pain, hypertension, and CVD management initiative as part of our learning collaborative. Thank you for leading the Q&A for this session, Dr. Dong. Thank you, Christine. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Freeman for your wonderful, very informative I want to use the word innovative presentation uh, in addressing the important role of pharmacists in the management of pain. So as a physician, really, I, I want to really echo the best possible uh, medication history are collected by uh, our pharmacist colleagues because they are so knowledgeable about drug allergies, all current prescription, non-prescription medications, including pills, uh, patches, sprays, topical products, uh, products, and so on. But also as a, a researcher, I am really aware that pharmacists have up to 10 more times interactions with patients than their primary um, uh, care providers. So only natural for pharmacists to take the leadership role in the management of pain. But as a non-pharmacist, uh, uh, Dr. Freeman, I want to ask you a quick question. What is the greatest challenge that pharmacist-driven stewardship encounters? That's an excellent question. I think when starting a pain management program that is pharmacy-driven, 
the greatest challenge that one might encounter is garnering support from the hospital's administration. The reason why I say this is because this involves a financial commitment to upholding the principles of the Society um, of Pain and Palliative Care Pharmacists, as well as ASHP, which recommend a dedicated full-time pharmacy serve in that role. Most hospitals would prefer that uh, stewardship be conducted with all of the pharmacies, and that is the goal. But in the studies that I showed uh, at the conclusion or at the end of the slide deck, all of those were conducted by pay management specialists that served in a dedicated role at their institution. So I would challenge uh, pharmacists who are wanting to duplicate those types of outcomes to emphasize that the literature has shown that when there is a dedicated pharmacist in that role, then the cost savings or cost avoidances can be realized. It's very difficult to pinpoint or to capture uh, a staff pharmacist's uh, ability to do that because they're pulled in so many different directions. It, they're pulled into order entry and to um, detecting uh, medication errors and drug interactions. And you can imagine if your hand is in multiple pots, it's really difficult to kind of focus on opioid stewardship all of the time. So again, the greatest challenge I feel is developing a programs plan where the hospital administration supports the pharmacy-led pain management program financially. Well, thank you. I like, I like the answer. So, uh, Dr. Freeman, your practice and your leadership at the Wellstar Cobb Medical Center certainly impressive and uh, pioneering. So, we have to hear a little bit from your experience. Does integration of an energetic stewardship pharmacist into the team change any of the roles? that the care team members serve. For example, with the medication reconciliation or con consultant. With regards to changing of roles, I think in my practice serving as the full-time pain management pharmacist here at Wellstar Cobb, I noticed a willingness of physicians to utilize our service. And I wouldn't necessarily necessarily say relinquish um, their uh, willingness to manage patients with pain, but they definitely appreciated the fact that there was someone with pain management training and expertise who could help them with the more difficult patients. With regards to medication reconciliation, we do know that that is a joint commission required responsibility. And with the new um, 2018 guidelines, there is a focus on the opioid um, medication reconciliation. I think that if uh, PDMP access is granted to all disciplines, physicians, nurses, and pharmacists, then collaboratively, the role can be shared. But of course, pharmacists have um, the unique role of managing medications or detecting uh, problems with prescribing. So the pharmacist should probably maintain um, the lead with medication reconciliation as it relates to opioid management. Very good, thank you. And uh, Dr. Freeman, you and I and everybody in the audience will know chronic pain is complicated and complex, which is often accompanied by comorbidities such as uh, mood, sleep, substance abuse, uh, substance abuse disorders, and other chronic conditions. And if insufficiently managed, these comorbidities can have a significant impact on the pain experience. So they can also result in like uh, complex medication regimes that can increase risk of drug interactions and side effects. So how do you perceive pharmacists 
taking leadership roles in this regard? Well, in my own experience, it has been the most challenging to streamline the process where we get the consult for these most difficult patients early on in the patient stay. Many times our physicians rely on our um, with opioid withdrawal order sets or um, on their own clinical expertise in managing the patients, but don't take into consideration that when a patient who is addicted to opioids or who has opioid use disorder on maintenance medications such as methadone or buprenorphine come in, that these patients' um, pain management needs are often significantly higher than a patient who doesn't have the comorbidities that you um, stated. And so by addressing that early on, we can improve the patient's hospital experience by preemptively increasing the amount of medication that they use for their acute pain management experience with the expectation that as they heal and get closer to discharge, that those medications are tapered. And we also should solicit our behavioral health support team to, and, and psych, psychiatry team to partner with us during the, those patients' um, hospitalization so that after discharge, they're not left without resources to help them with their comorbidity and possibly get help for their opioid use disorder or addiction. So the pharmacist's role is one wherein, again, they utilize their drug expertise, knowing that uh, medications such as methadone or buprenorphine, because of the way they mm -hmm. work at the various receptors, require uh, higher amounts of opioid medications to address acute pain. And then again, as patient functionality improves, begin mm -hmm. tapering that medication down uh, so that the patient isn't constantly exposed to the opioid and possibly reinforce their craving or addiction. And again, psychiatry and our behavioral health liaisons can help us with that by referring them to our patient resources as it gets closer to discharge. Absolutely. Well, kind of follow that line of thought, uh, Dr. Freeman. Okay, so uh, after discharge, um, many medications used for pain in patients may cause withdrawal and the discontinuation symptoms if doses are reduced too quickly or the medication is discontinued too uh, abruptly. So, how pharmacists really can play a key role in identifying medication that should be discontinued? Very good. Um, maybe two or three years ago, John Hopkins um, anesthesia and surgery team, along with patients who had been a part of their service, participated in a um, round table wherein the Surgeons ask the patients, how much of your pain medication did you use after discharge? And did you experience any adverse effects? And based upon this study, the patient's reply was, well, you prescribed me 30 tablets or 15 tablets, but I only used two. And so the mm. physicians and uh, other prescribers, such as the hospitalists, took this information into consideration and mm. created what is known as the Johns Hopkins SOLVE study. And for those patients that had common surgical um, interventions while they were in the hospital, they developed the amount of opioid prescriptions that should be prescribed and provided a way for those medications to be appropriately tapered over a three to five day mm. time period. The SOLVE initiative strongly encourages non-opioid therapies to be administered around the clock, such mm. that the risk of an opioid uh, withdrawal syndrome is less. 
Also keep in mind that opioid tapering actually began prior to discharge. So the mm -hmm. likelihood of an acute withdrawal syndrome was lessened as well. Very good. In, in the interest of time, we only have one more uh, final question, okay? Yes. Um, the stereotype, Dr. Freeman, is that uh, pharmacists are like journalists, right? A uh, professional who can answer any questions about medications, even suggest the best over-the-counter remedy for minor bruises and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, pharmacists in the pain management are highly specialized, which require additional training, and I would imagine a forecast residency as well. So how pharmacists should take the leadership, change the, the culture, and not, uh, you know, you and I and everybody knows really shifting culture, it takes time. How or well, pharmacy college can, up more, can be more up front the line in this regard? Well, now that we are in the throes of the opioid epidemic, um, having pain management pharmacists that are specialized with opioid utilization and risk mitigation is very important. Um, I think at last count, there are 38 ASHSP approved PGY2 pain management residencies that help pharmacists to gain those clinical skills to help patients. But as you mentioned, pharmacists are generalists. Our four mm -hmm. years of training help us to manage a plethora of disease states and pain management is no different. Now there is a concerted effort to change pharmacy curriculums so that pain management is covered more diffusely uh, in the curriculum as opposed to designating one module to pain management because not all pharmacists practice in the hospital setting. There are some that are in your local community pharmacists or in a home health situation, but our patients are everywhere. And so when pharmacists have a strong foundation in um, drug management as it relates to pain management, then their ability to help patients across the continuum of care improves uh, correspondingly. So I think it is very incumbent upon the pharmacy schools and the curriculums to emphasize pain management, not just opioid stewardship, but overall pain management, so that there is less emphasis on opioids. But if we encounter mm -hmm. patients that are using these medications, um, we know how to manage them. Very good. So Dr. Freeman, it's a pleasure to work with you. Now, uh, in the issue of time, again, let's turn the floor to Christine. Christine, here you go. Thank you, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Dong for this great presentation and Q&A. And thank you to our audience for your participation. A feedback survey will pop up in the lobby after you exit this session. We will have the recording of today's session posted on heart.org forward slash pain management in a few weeks. Please be sure to check out this website for current and future educational opportunities and to join our mailing list. Coming up next at 2 p.m. Central, we have disparities in pain, promoting health equity through multimodal pain management. Thank you very much for attending the summit. We will see you shortly.